Hello, everybody. Good afternoon or greetings wherever you are in the universe and welcome to the second of three closeout webinars organized by WAPI, the West Africa Biodiversity and Climate Change Program, which is a five-year USAID funded program. The goal of WABIC has been to improve conservation and climate resilient, low emissions growth across West Africa. WABIC has worked through three main core program learning areas comprising combating wildlife trafficking, increasing coastal resilience to climate change, and reducing deforestation, degradation, and biodiversity loss. WABIC is closing out, as I said, it's already five years now. And uh, as part of the close out activities, WABIC is organizing these webinars to share learning. For this afternoon, we have a conversation around effective transboundary forest management approaches. And to do that, let me quickly take you through the itinerary for the, for the afternoon. Um, as soon as I finish what I'm doing, the welcome and introduction by me, the facilitator. We will take our first presentation on establishing baselines and biomonitoring. And then we'll take the second presentation, effective integrated practices for law enforcement, local, national, transboundary. The next presentation is on integrating sustainable livelihoods into transboundary forest management. And then we'll have the last one on strengthening partnerships and policies for effective transboundary forest conservation. We end our day with a session on what's next, linking people, institutions, practices, policies across scales for effective transboundary forest management. There would be a question and answer session, and then we wrap up. However, for you participants, if you look on the screen at the bottom, there's a Q&A button. So even as the presentations are going on, you are invited to send questions there and we'll be responding to those questions. Next to the Q&A button is an interpretation button. So you click that button, two channels will come up, one in English, the other in French. Click the appropriate language that suits you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to this webinar. Now, may I invite the first speaker, Malavika, who, um, we'll be speaking to the topic, establishing baselines and biomonitoring. By way of introduction, Malavika is a technical specialist species conservation for Fauna and Flora International, FFI. She's a wildlife ecologist with nine years of experience in field research, and she has gained knowledge of ecological field techniques, social research methods, and analytical skills. She has experience working on community-based natural resource management, sustainable livelihood interventions, capacity development, behavior change communication, and project management. With a broad research interest in conservation, she is especially interested in human-wildlife interaction across different landscape, ecosystem, socioeconomic, and cultural systems. Having a psychological background, She's also interested in the human-human dimensions of human-animal interaction with nine years experience in the field of research. Ladies and gentlemen, please receive Malavika. Um, thank you, Emilia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting an overview of biomonitoring activities implemented on behalf of all the WABIC grantees. Um, I'll be switching off my video because of the, ban the bandwidth uh, internet here. Um, sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. So this, oh, this map is to give um, an idea of the transboundary landscape. We'll be taking, talking throughout this webinar, where all the partners have been implemented of the project activities. Um, you can see in the southeast, the yellow circle is the Thai Grebel Kran and Sapo landscape. Um, in the northwest, the purple circle is the Ziyama in Guinea and Wonagizi Wologizi in Liberia. And um, the orange is the Gola forest, both in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Poya forest. Next slide, please. 
So the purpose of the biomonitoring activities was to understand and monitor biodiversity of transboundary forest areas for FFT management and to strengthen forest conservation and secure connectivity within these forests. Also to build capacity of stakeholders for transboundary conservation. So when the projects began, we had limited data on biodiversity, uh, unlimited knowledge of species presence and distributions across this landscape. Uh, most of this monitoring uh, was focused on a few methods and the biomonitoring activities was also focused on, was implemented in only protected areas. So there was limited scientific evidence to support future gazettements of proposed protected areas. Um, there was also limited collaborations between partners on species monitoring. Um, next slide, please. So the strategies, um, uh, and approaches that were adapted to this, address this, was to focus on collecting additional data on biodiversity, increasing knowledge of species presence, the distribution and abundance where possible, to carry out biomonitoring activities outside of protected areas, for example, community forests or buffer zones, to promote collaborations between partners, to develop and introduce new methods in biomonitoring, using of different sampling methods like rapid biodiversity assessment to establish base science in areas like proposed protected areas to help in uh, gazettements of those areas. Um, also involvement of mixed group of experts from different background to be working together in the field, for example, communities, partners, uh, park staff, uh, and also partners from neighboring countries. Um, this also led to focus on improving the capacity uh, building for all of these uh, stakeholders. One of the examples, uh, next slide please, is the use of camera traps in, uh, in place of line transacts, uh, which was implemented uh, by most of the partners uh, in, in, during the VABIC uh, grants. So the line transact distance sampling method was, is actually a pop popular method for estimating of abundance when laying out transacts, either randomly or systematically at predetermined distance. You walk along these transacts to detect objects, um, like collecting direct and indirect observations which included dung, footprints, nests, vocalizations, or even illegal activities uh, like poaching or traps, animal traps, etc. However, um, this is this detection of object is not uh, potentially has variable variability in detection as animals tend to avoid human observers. There are observer bias on identifying the signs or the calls of the animals. Um, detection of dungs or nests in the field also depends on the environment. For example, during a uh, wet season, you, there might be difficulty in detecting dungs on the ground uh, because of the fallen leaves. Um, and there are also possibility of missing elusive and rare species, uh, for example, pygmy hippos and or nocturnal species. So uh, some of the partners uh, started using camera traps, which kind of represent a potential alternative or a combination of both camera traps and line transects to see uh, which are the best uh, method to use in the field to improve the detection of species, um, which would include rare species or nocturnal species. Um, there's also a new method where we are using distance sampling uh, for camera traps, which kind of give an accurate way of estimating wild animal populations, especially for terrestrial and semi-terrestrial species. Next slide, please. Um, in Sapo National Park, uh, a biomonitoring protocol uh, was uh, previously established with line transacts uh, for monitoring uh, species. Uh, there was a total of 90 transacts of two kilometer uh, length was uh, established. And um, in 2018, we had the highest survey efforts uh, since the establishment of biomonitoring activities with about 78 transacts out of 90 transacts. Uh, 42 species uh, were identified during this um, uh, survey, 32 man mammals, nine bird species, and one invertebrate, which was a snail. Um, during the project, uh, the biomonitoring protocol was uh, updated from Ryan Transax to various methods, uh, including camera traps, uh, species-specific surveys, and has been now implemented. Uh, a five-year biomonitoring plan was developed and was uh, submitted to the uh, forestry department to see if we can follow through uh, different methods annually. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
camera traps was first uh, implemented. It's the first systematic camera traps, which was done in support of Vabic funds. Um, 90 cameras was established uh, or deployed uh, for 90 days and uh, across three grids, uh, as you can see in the map, we had about 250,000 plus images of which 40 species was identified. Um, just keep in mind that this was a conservative estimate of the identification as it was made only at family or sub-family level and still a preliminary results, of which 11 were globally uh, threatened species. For example, elephants um, and pygmy hippos. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, Wonagisi landscape, uh, for the first time, biomonitoring uh, activity was implemented, a protocol was developed, um, and seven uh, forestry department uh, staffs were uh, trained, along with 15 community auxiliaries were uh, uh, trained, uh, and eight students helped in doing so. Protocols that have been uh, uh, monthly biomonitoring patrols have been uh, carried out, and there's one team per zone which has three zones in the landscape. In Ziyama and Wolagizi, the six rap surveys were conducted large mammals, amphibians, and reptiles, insects, plants, birds uh, were some of the rap surveys were conducted, and new, some of the new species were discovered uh, in this landscape, for example, butterflies and some uh, a new. Shrew was discovered, uh, which still uh, awaiting results from molecular tests. Next slide, please. A, a similar camera trap was also developed by uh, uh, implemented in F by FFI. Uh, it was the first camera trap survey in Wallagizi. Uh, Sixty tra tra camera traps were deployed uh, along the two grids. Um, Twenty-seven thousand images were captured, and thirty-nine species were identified. Um, also in Ziyama, a systematic camera trap survey was implemented, although there were other camera trap survey that was uh, happening before. Um, the images are not yet analyzed, um, but there are plans to do more camera trap survey in these areas. Next slide, please. In the Ziyama, Wanagizi, Wolagizi landscape, uh, a landscape level assessment was carried out. Uh, this was to this, the results uh, indicated that there was an increased forest loss between the agricultural corridor and buffer areas around roads outside of protected areas. It was a high levels of the deforestation from Guinea uh, border, and, in, and there was an increasing encroachment around the boundaries of both Monagizi and Wolagizi, especially along the roads. But however, there was a minimal deforestation within the core of these protected areas. Uh, Um, in Thai National Park, WCF uh, implemented uh, camera traps using distance sampling method. They had uh, 291 point tracks, but had to uh, install 285 point transacts. They did a video uh, camera trapping survey. Um, they had about 58,524 videos of which, from which they identified 98 species, uh, which uh, included uh, chimpanzees, elephants, pygmy hippos, uh, different three types, uh, three kinds of pangolins, and etc. Um, they also observed uh, human presence, uh, of which uh, 39 observations were made uh, of poachers in the landscape. In Grebokan uh, National Park, uh, both line transects and camera traps were uh, in implemented. Uh, the line transects, they had 250 uh, line transverse of one kilometer length, and um, uh, they identified 39 mammal species, where, and they also deployed 464 cameras uh, using the point transact method similar to Thai National Park, um, of which 41 uh, mammal species were identified using the camera traps. Next slide, please. Some of the outsourced from these um, biomonitoring surveys was we have a comprehensive list of uh, species, uh, which includes large mammals, mam small mammals, birds, amphibians, replies, etc. Uh, we also have a comprehensive list of CITES IUCN uh, threatened species now 
available. Uh, we have improved knowledge of distribution. We have discovery of new species, uh, for example, butterfly, otter, uh, West African squeaker frog. And also we have found species that were not found in a, in a, in a new area. We found Nimba otter shrew in the Wallagizi area, which was first time detected. Um, in Gola landscape, they use different methods uh, to implement their biomonitoring activities and uh, based on the frequency of the activity. For example, primate, chimpanzee, and pygmy hippos were surveys carried out every five years. Some of the outcomes uh, from these activities is that we have increased capacity for species monitoring, increased knowledge about biodiversity, which might improve boost ecotourism. As mentioned before, there are discoveries of new species. We now have species specific protocol like pygmy hippo uh, monitoring protocol and multi-species monitor protocol, which the camera trap is a very useful uh, method. Um, these protocols were developed based in with inputs from partners from across the project uh, sites. We also have an improved collaboration between conservation partners through national uh, platforms, for example, Biomonitoring Subcommittee, uh, which is under the Species Working Group uh, Liberia. Some of the lessons learned. Um, the use of mobile device has been very useful in collecting the data, but the internet could be a limitation. Uh, there's a robust data, uh, baseline data is critical for establishing uh, sustainable long-term species monitoring. Uh, there is a gap of uh, knowledge and that needs to be addressed urgently to complement information uh, of the fauna information. Uh, new species may attract conservation support and funds. Um, there is a need for more time for institutional capacity development, sensitization and feedback of all the activities across the landscape need to be uh, informing the local communities uh, and it has to be an ongoing process. Uh, we have to integrate tools like landscape level assessment into future strategies to secure and manage wildlife corridors. Human wildlife conflict mitigation should be integrated into conservation strategies. Reviewing and updating monitoring protocols should be regularly done and there should be regular refresher course for biomonitoring teams so that we get a robust uh, data from the field. Um, there should also be important that mixed expertise in the field is good for sharing knowledge and best practices. Um, adaptive management should be factored in implementation of survey to account for unforeseen circumstances like COVID, which delayed most of the uh, activities this year. Um, some of the partners also mentioned that the COVID-19 could be uh, the detrimental uh, for uh, from, you know, discouraging poachers from hunting, but we had a different case in Sapu landscape where the hunting was more during this COVID-19. Um, yep, uh, that's, these are the information from the, all the partners and thank you to all my colleagues and the partners in making the presentation. Thank you very much, um, Malavika, and thank you participants who have joined us. So the presentation you heard is from one of the partners on behalf of all the partners that um, Wabik worked with, uh, with in this particular instance. I'd like to invite the next speaker to make the presentation on the topic, Effective Integrated Practices for Law Enforcement, Local, National, Transboundary, Emmanuel. Emmanuel is the director, um, is a country director for the Wild Chimpanzee Foundation, WCF in Cote d'Ivoire. She's a specialist in biodiversity conservation with an experience of more than 10 years in the preservation of the Thai Sapo Forest Complex. She has oriented the actions of WCF Cote d'Ivoire towards the strengthening of law enforcement, monitoring and independent observation. Emmanuel, your turn, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna present, uh, so what was developed by the different WABI grantees in West Africa uh, about law enforcement. So next slide. Law enforcement uh, is essential for the preservation of biodiversity. Without law enforcement, the impact of other conservation activities will be reduced. 
Several studies have revealed that regular and sustained patrol system in place can help predict the survival of great apes. In the forest landscape in West Africa, in the remaining forest areas, we have observed high, high rates of illegal activities such as hunting, mining, and farming cocoa in protected areas. Except for Thai National Park, representing a model for the law enforcement in the sub-region, the observation is that there are few government resources for the application of the law. And for example, there is only six rangers in Gravel Crown National Park and 10 in Cavalier Classified Forest. Um, and for sure, supporting salary and insurance for state agents is a real investment that the government has to bear. Next slide. Therefore, uh, strategic actions, um, approaches and adaptation uh, were developed to support the governments for law enforcement with, for example, the recruitment of community eco-guards, sensitization, by engaging broader stakeholders, by developing new partnership, new tools like SMART, by building capacities, supporting patrols, joint patrols, developing a transboundary technical committee for law enforcement in the Thai Sapo forest complex, and to develop a plan engaging authorities and civil society. Next slide. The output of these actions are agreements, tools and training and effectively an effective law enforcement. Concerning the agreements, we noted an, that an MOU was signed between the Gola protected, uh, the, the Gola project, sorry, and the MRU security unit. The setup of the Transboundary Law Enforcement Technical Committee for the Thai Sapo and the Law Enforcement Subcommittee sub set up in Liberia. Um, and and um, the last um, uh, engagement or group uh, was the Liberia Wildlife Crime Task Force that was created in Liberia as well. Concerning the tools and the training, um, we noted that the tool SMART uh, was uh, developed in um, new protected areas and was supported in, in other areas of the, of the, the different complex. And capacity building workshops on law enforcement were very useful to tackle the different problems that were encountered um, in the different protected areas. Awareness raising um, missions and the support of governments with free cars uh, that were donated to FDA, OIPR, and SODI4 really led, uh, helped in enforcing the actions on the ground. In terms of um, actions, the program supported monthly pa patrols uh, in the TGKS complex which allowed a decrease in illegal activities. In the area of the Cavalli classified forest, uh, we were informed that more than 3000 people left the forest following a combination of theater and support of patrolling and monitoring. Between um, 2017 and 2020, we have a clear decrease in deforestation rate in this forest of uh, 72%. Next slide, please. Some, um, here we can have the, some graphs and photos about some results of the SMART program on the Sapo National Park, revealing, revealing that Sapo was effectively patrolled for one and a half year, and that we can see clearly that all the forest was covered and that we can see um, a decrease in um, human activities encountered in the forest. Next slide. So the outcome of all these investments um, are first that instead of this image that you can see of the burnt forest, we now have, for example, difficulties to walk in the abandoned farm of the Cavalier classified forest where pioneer species begin, be, begin to recolonize the forest. Wildlife is still encountered, and so we have now hope again that the forest can regenerate and be maintained as an important habitat of wildlife. 
Uh, additionally, in the trust built with communities, the Um, so now with the trust built with the communities, uh, we have observed that there is a threat reduction and uh, that it's easier now to um, have action in rescuing hunted, hunted wildlife and pets. With the, sorry, I didn't finish yet, but uh, with the bilateral agreement uh, and the cross-border collaboration, uh, we have now an engagement of the authorities of um, different countries to really act on, um, on the different traffic, on the poaching um, that we could observe um, in the transboundary landscapes. Next slide. Um, these activities helped us to review the different lesson learns. First, the cross-border cooperation and law enforcement uh, was really a success, but it's a slow and sensitive project process. All the laws need to be reviewed and it needs additional supports to effectively uh, start to act on the ground. Additional support and training is needed for law enforcement across the landscape. That's not a short-term engagement. It should really be a long-term engagement in all the different protected areas and in all different parts of the landscape to effectively have an effect. Um, we could see that in the first um, slide that, I sh that uh, was presented with the um, 15 years of biomonitoring and law enforcement in Pine National Park. Enforcement, um, then another lesson that is like enforcement could be enhanced with involvement of civil society. We're talking and developing now um, aspects of independent monitoring where civil society has a major role to play. Then um, additional harmonization of laws um, is needed to be able to cover the gaps that we can have to that prevent um, effective law enforcement at the transboundary level. Then transboundary co collaboration can enhance overall landscape management. And uh, finally, continuous training is fundamental. Next slide. I would like to, thank, to conclude by thanking the partners that help reaching these important results, the regional and national partners, as well as the landscape grantees and partners. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, and thank you both for uh, staying within time for the presentation. I, I applaud you. If we were actually seeing we're together, we would all be clapping for you now. So I'm clapping on behalf of everybody else who is on this call, these 80 people who can clap, I'm clapping for on their behalf. Now, thank you very much. I would like to invite the next presenter. And the next presenter is going to present on the topic integrating sustainable livelihoods into transboundary forest management. And the presentation will be done by Laura Bisley. And Laura is the Conservation Officer for Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, RSPB, Global Land Unit. Part of the three-year USAID funded project to reduce deforestation and biodiversity loss in the greater Gola landscape in West Africa. Laura has been responsible for project monitoring and evaluation and supporting project implementation. The project used training in sustainable livelihoods and awareness raising to empower communities and to reduce pressure on the forest. Laura, over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'm presenting on sustainable livelihoods and resilience on behalf of all the WABIT grantees. Uh, next slide. So the purpose of our livelihoods work was to engage forest edge communities to curb threats to biodiversity and conservation. We engage communities through awareness raising and providing livelihood opportunities that are beneficial for both the people and the forest that we're working in. To achieve that, we included women's and youth empowerment exchange visits between projects and across borders as a learning opportunity and livelihood activities were mostly done using farmer field schools and practical learning. 
Next slide. So we're just gonna cover some of the results of the different grantee projects. So for the project led by the Wild Chimp Chimpanzee Foundation in Liberia, uh, beekeeping was one of their livelihood activities. They trained members of communities around the forest edge in beekeeping with the aim of producing and selling honey as a way of making an income. The beekeeping work was focused on women and to make the project more secure, their subcontractor universal outreach um, were guaranteed by uh, the honey produced. Next slide. WCF also included agriculture in their livelihoods work. So they had eight different farming activities, including lowland rice and cassava farming. But all of the activities had the aim of demonstrating and teaching, that would, teaching alternative practices that would make farming conservation friendly. And the agriculture work didn't just include training, they also provided rice and cassava mills and rehabilitated storage facilities to make the work easier and to improve production. Next slide. Continuing um, the focus on women's empowerment, uh, women's exchange groups were created in beekeeping, local chocolate making, ecotourism, cassava and vegetable farming. The exchanges gave the women a chance to collaborate and share ideas with other groups, which they could then bring back and use in their own communities. Next slide. Okay, moving on to GOLA, which covers both Liberia and Sierra Leone. Um, part of our work was on sustainable value chains to sell the, pro the farmer's produce. A lot of work had already been done to establish a cocoa business and a cocoa, cocoa value chain in Sierra Leone. So the Wabic project helped to strengthen that value chain and um, created an umbrella organization to manage the existing producer associations. And I think you can see a picture of the organization's cocoa warehouse in the middle. Yeah. And the producer associations also achieved fair trade certification during the project. Wabic also helped to kickstart our plans to develop a small scale chocolate making business um, with the purchase of chocolate making equipment. And in Liberia, the first farmers associations in the project area were, were established and cocoa work was started to be scaled up um, with a view to do a similar thing as we've done in Sierra Leone. Next slide. We also included um, agriculture in our project, so rice, ground nuts and vegetables. And as well as using farmer field school approach um, to teach forest friendly farming, we tried to strengthen links with markets and city buyers as well. We also set up loan groups, which as well as providing loans to the group members, they taught about savings, record keeping and good business. In Liberia, this was a women's focused activity that empowered the members of the groups to set up their own small businesses. And because we were working across two countries, um, the project partner organisations and the communities, they all had different experiences and different strengths. So exchange visits for all the activities were a really useful way to share knowledge and to get new ideas for both the communities and the project staff as well. Next slide. On the Sapo National Park project in Liberia, they also had a pilot beekeeping and sustainable agriculture activities for communities around the national park. Their pilot projects reached 527 people directly and over 3000 people indirectly. Next slide. The project um, distributed pepper and bitable seeds and had a fairly even split of males and females that were involved in beekeeping, cassava and vegetable farming. And farmers saw sales of their products. Um, one example is a farmer who sold their pepper produce um, for 11,000 Liberian dollars or 60 US. Next slide. Okay. 
Uh, so some of the outcomes in SAPO, um, the pilot saw some positive changes in the, in the communities. For example, um, women in particular, because of the opportunities they'd had to join loan groups. More women were then working in small trade businesses. And as a result, women who were often seen as voiceless in their communities, um, they now had their voice um, because they were earning an income and could contribute to family costs like school and hospital fees. Generally, social ties in the communities got stronger through the opportunity to work together. The extra income people have from the livelihood activities now mean they're able to spend more money on things like repairing and refurbishing their houses and to spend on school fees. So um, house conditions have improved in the area and more children are able to go to school. And because of the engagement of the project in general, more youth and more women um, have become involved in conservation. Okay, and uh, finally, we've got some key lessons from all the grantees on livelihoods. Uh, we found that including livelihood activities was a must for conservation work. It built trust and cooperation between communities and our organizations. Um, communities then had greater trust in conservation, which then allowed and encouraged the conservation focused activities to happen. And one of the keys to that um, was engaging with the heads of communities and they became important advocates for the projects. And we also found that real lasting change takes time, especially when there are limited options for income in these communities and changing to a new business or a new farming technique can feel like a high risk move. Um, next slide. So um, thank you to our partners and to everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> so I, again, applause for Laura and all those who have already presented. And I'm going to quickly move on to invite our next presenter. But to you participants, please, when you look at the bottom, there's a bar there and there's a button Q&A. So as you are listening to the presentations, you can start posting questions there and the presenters who have already presented will go there and start responding to your questions. So we are expecting to see some questions in the Q&A column. However, we have designed the itinerary in such a way that there will be a Q&A session at the end of this um, webinar. Um, for those of you who have just joined us, welcome to the second of the three close-out webinars that WAPIC is organizing. So for the next presenter, Shadrach, Shadrach is going to be talking to us about um, strengthening partnerships and policies for effective transboundary forest conservation. And ladies and gentlemen, Shadrach is a conservation biologist with over 10 years of experience in biodiversity conservation, natural resource management, and community engagement. He has experience working on forest governance, protected area management, landscape level and transboundary conservation, policy development, community-based natural resource management, sustainable, sustainable livelihood interventions, capacity development and behavior change communication. With experience in both the ecological and socioeconomic dimensions of natural resource management, he is interested in exploring the intricacies associated with balancing conservation and development to design practical solutions that enhance the well-being of communities while promoting sustainability. Shadrach, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so are we talking um, about the work that all of the Wabi grantees in the Manor River countries have done? Um, so I'll be talking about partnerships and policies and how they have helped to strengthen conservation. So the purpose of this was um, to support and promote partnerships, innovative policy initiatives, and forest governance systems that empower stakeholders to implement effective transboundary management of the remaining forests in the Manor River Union Basin. So in the beginning, um, before the start of this grant, there was limited bilateral collaboration. Um, communities were not fully involved uh, in conservation. There was also limited involvement of lawmakers and other high-level policymakers, as well as local administrators in 
conservation initiatives. There was a uh, limited coordination between various government ministries and agencies um, to promote conservation. Um, women and youth were not really involved in conservation activities. And there was limited funding to facilitate collaborative platforms that partners had identified as being important for conservation. Um, and species action plans, which are very useful in uh, planning and fundraising um, were outdated. Next slide, please. So what did we do and how did we do it? So basically we did um, four main things. We created an enabling environment. Um, we strengthened institutions. We worked to enhance policies and we engaged extensively with communities. Um, as it relates to an enabling environment, uh, we helped to promote bilateral agreements. We supported national and regional co collaborative platform. For example, the Species Working Group in Liberia and a Transboundary Law Enforcement Committee between um, Liberia and Africa's. We also work on species action plans. We had learning events, exchange visits and study tours within the region, outside the region and also within the countries. And we also promoted intersectoral initiatives between government ministries and agencies. And then for institutional strengthening, this was a lot of capacity building for government and other stakeholders. So uh, conservation organizations, but also members of local communities and organizations at the community level. Um, we also work to enhance policy so, for example, in Liberia, the conservation, the 2016 conservation law, we drafted a policy to help to operationalize this law, uh, regulations to help to op operationalize this law. And the partners, uh, amongst the partners, awareness raising was one of the key ways in which they engage with communities. So, uh, print the electronic media, face to face conversations, meetings. We had a lot of awareness raising outreach in communities. We work with community governance structure. Uh, so whether it was working with chiefs in Sierra Leone or traditional institutions in Liberia or working around Sapo National Park to form community level governance institutions to promote collaborative management. Um, we also work with schools with the eye to the future. We work extensively with schools. So one of the ways we did that was uh, environmental clubs in schools that promoted conservation. Next slide, please. So what are some of our outputs? So for in, there was a bilateral agreement signed between Liberia and Guinea for the management of the Ziyama Wanugizi Wulugizi forest, which you see in the right-hand corner of your screen, our transboundary landscape between Liberia and Guinea. So our agreement was signed in October of last year and now you have collaborations between the rangers in Liberia and the rangers in Guinea. Um, they have joint patrols and they also have regular briefing meetings. Next slide, please. We also uh, signed a bilateral agreement between Liberia and Sierra Leone for the management of Gula Forest Transboundary Landscape. So as you all know, Gula has been a peace pack uh, since uh, it was initiated as a national pact. It's a peace pact between the two countries. So the bilateral agreement was finally signed um, and the, earlier this year, and it has helped to facilitate conservation between Liberia and Sierra Leone in the Gola Forest. Next slide, please. So before the start of the grant, uh, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire have been working toward the joint management of the entire Google Crown Sapo landscape which uh, this landscape in the southeast of Liberia contiguous into Africa is one of the largest area of tropical rainforest in the world. Um, so under this grant, uh, the challenge of having regular meetings to operationalize the activities of the Transboundary Committee was supported. Um, and one of the output of that was actually the setting of a law enforcement technical committee that met regularly throughout the grant, um, helping to improve uh, engagement and collaboration between rangers 
and county administrators in Liberia and Arapos. Next slide, please. So we also updated two regional species action plan, um, one for the pygmy hippopotamus. A workshop was held in July last year. Uh, and as a result of the workshop, uh, the strategy was produced, is available in French and English. And also a regional strategy was also updated for the Western chimpanzee. And we, the, 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 the idea behind this is that these strategies can be used as tools for conservation planning, but also can be used to help partners to fundraise and, and target their activities. Next slide, please. Um, learning exchange was one of the one of the ways that the grant sought to encourage learning of the participants. So there was a study tool to Namibia where you had uh, lawmakers, you had uh, county superintendents, you had uh, FDA Forest Development Authority employees participating, and was focused on learning more about transboundary conservation and community-based natural resource management. There was also another study tour to Ghana, uh, looking at the community resource management era model, which has you a lot of positive results in Ghana, taking people from the community to go there and see what other communities were doing um, and see how they could copy some of the ideas that had you resort uh, in Ghana. There was visit to Africos, uh, between Africos and Liberia uh, on income generating activities, learning from Tai National Park. The farmers from Gola in Liberia visited their counterparts in Sierra Leone to understand cocoa, the potential of sustainable cocoa farming and how they could uh, copy that in Liberia. Um, there were also farmer fee school visits uh, between Liberia and Guinea. Um, and then there was a lot of other visits between rangers from Liberia going to Africos, uh, rangers from Liberia going to Guinea, Guinea coming to Liberia, Africos going to Guinea. Uh, so a lot of rangers and project technical staff uh, interacted doing this learning exchange and the learning they got from there was implemented to improve conservation in their respective countries. Next slide, please. So what is the outcome of all of the things we have done? Um, overall, there's reduced threat to the integrity of the, the forest ecosystem in the landscape, uh, whether it's the Thai Global Crown Sapo landscape or the Ziyama Wolgisi Wolgisi landscape or the Greater Gola landscape. Um, and this was really done as a result, achieved as a result of partnerships that was formed, um, policy initiatives, initiatives that were undertaking and extensive engagement from the top down and from the bottom up. So that engagement among stakeholders also helped to improve the ecological state of the landscape. Um, collaboration between the Manor River Union Basin countries, um, which has led to protection of species across national boundaries. And one example uh, from that is Recently, some elephants crossed from Guinea to Liberia and then from Liberia to Agricos through the partnerships that were established on this grant. It was uh, utilized to ensure that those elephants were uh, as safe, actually. I just uh, understand that the elephants are back in Liberia after going uh, to Guinea and back to Liberia again. So collaboration um, increased trust, uh, especially collaboration between community and conservation actors. Uh, so we had increased prosecution of wildlife crimes, uh, in some cases helped by critical information provided by members of the community. Um, there was a community eviction of miners from SAPO, uh, the first time that has happened. In the past, miners were evicted by agents of the state, police or otherwise, with spillover, negative spillover effect to the communities. Um, uh, community level structures are now supporting conservation uh, across the countries. Um, in Liberia, there's a fully operational species working group, and this idea is being replicated in other MRU countries. 
and there's increased interest from the private sector about partnering with local communities and the government to do to promote ecotourism. And the policy gaps that were inherently, the policy gaps have been identified and hopefully they will lead to addressing the limitations that were found in them. Next slide, please. So what are the lessons we've learned? Um, partnerships can promote collaborative management, especially of transboundary landscapes. Um, national, regional, and site level platform can enhance trust among partners with a positive, net positive benefit for biodiversity. Um, regular meetings at the transboundary level bring up problems that uh, partners are facing in one country so that the partners in the other countries can anticipate and be ready to address them when they pop up in the country. Um, but when we get new policies, we need funds to operationalize and then adopt them because we risk just having them on the books without funds to operationalize them. Learning exchange for them will be very useful in promoting and strengthening policies and partnership. Um, and I think this is something that has come across really strongly in this grant. Once communities are engaged uh, actively in project implementation, they will be able to take ownership and drive the process forward. Um, and mainstreaming conservation through traditional leaderships or community level governance structures can promote buying and ownership at the community level. Um, and the most important, one of the most important ones actually is all of what we've done, there's a need to have to get funding to consolidate and strengthen it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shadrach. Um, and thank you all presenters. Um, so now we go on to the very last presentation, but I'd like to draw your attention, all presenters, uh, panelists, to go to the Q&A button. There are some questions there that require your attention. Shadrach, there's one specifically uh, uh, addressed to you. So please Please go there and be answering people's responses. Actually, also click the answered button. There's a, there are a number of questions from Rebecca that have been answered, but I think that the rest of you panelists can also take a look at those questions. Now, may I invite uh, Nuhu to talk to us about, and so what? What next? We have heard about establishing baselines, effective integ integrated practices, integrating sustainable livelihoods, strengthening partnerships, and then we want to talk about, so what next? Linking people, institutions, practices, and policies across scales for effective transboundary forest management. Dr. Nungundam served as a forest and landscape specialist for the West Africa Biodiversity and Climate Change Program throughout the life of the project. Until recently, he was a component lead for reducing deforestation, forest degradation, and biodiversity loss, one of Wabik's key learning areas. He has over 10 years experience in West Africa with particular focus on the Mano River Union countries where he coordinated key transboundary forest landscape conservation work. Nuhu. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are very grateful to have this. Uh, are you hearing me? Uh, call, uh, I'm supposed to yeah, talk. Go on, no, go on, carry yeah. on. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you, we appreciate um, the various contribution. And I just want to say that um, all this work that you have heard of uh, is um, contributing towards um, conserving the remaining core forest of West Africa. And the forest that you can see now, it is only 10% of what used to be as West African forest. And we lost um, 
already 90%, and 30% uh, of this in the last 40 years. So um, your work is contributing to make sure that this core uh, area um, remain um, protected. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see the map of West Africa here um, with the remaining forest uh, really focusing on between Guinea um, to Togo. And uh, if you look at the dark green, uh, those are the what we call, call the core remaining forest. And this is where through our consultation with our national partner and regional partner, uh, we decided to work, concentrate on this core area that you can see. There's one, two big block, really. One is uh, southeast between Liberia and, and, and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and the other block is spread between um, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. So we have two uh, transboundary landscapes there to work with uh, the, 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 those countries. So next slide. So um, our, our key purpose is to reduce deforestation, forest um, degradation, and biodiversity loss uh, in this core area uh, in, in West Africa. And our approach was to focus on this key area, which is in the in Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And our approach, again, was that um, we work with the partner at the landscape um, with the full support of national um, uh, partner uh, in Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, Guinea, and contributing to our regional um, partners uh, mandate, which is ECOWAS and uh, Mano River Union and Abidjan Convention. And uh, the intervention that we are, you are some of the key. We make sure that we understand the, the wildlife diversity in those key landscapes. We monitor them. We make sure that uh, law are uh, enforced to protect them. We make sure that the forest edge community are supportive of this initiative uh, to protect uh, the forest and the biodiversity. We make sure that we don't work alone. We work with partners and we initiate some policy that can work on the ground. And all this is to contribute to conservation, the sustainable landscape management of this key area. Next, please. So you can see in this map uh, that uh, we have three complex uh, uh, transboundary landscape. Um, here on the left, you have the Gola transboundary landscape between Sierra Leone and Liberia. And it's made of protected um, national park, uh, national forest, forest reserve, community forest, and also agricultural land. So we want to work in this complex to make sure that the, the, there's a sustainable management of this size. Um, in the north part of the uh, block, we have the Ziyama Wologizi, Wonogizi, a forest, uh, across Guinea and Liberia. We have Ziyama, Wonogizi, and Wologizi. Uh, here again, it's a very complex landscape. One is a bifer reserve in Guinea, and the other one are uh, not yet protected. And we are working towards their protection. One is the Gazetman package for Wonogizi has just been submitted to FDA uh, to well, full protection of this. Uh, 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 landscape and the biodiversity knowledge of Wologizi for the first time under Wabig had been tapped to be able to share and show to the, in the nation the value of this uh, mountain forest range. The far end, as a, a right of the map, you have um, a Thai Grebo forest. And uh, again, it's a, one of the complex one we have 
you can see the tile, the, the, I would say the largest um, West Africa um, rainforest uh, uh, of, uh, national park of uh, West Africa. And you have a Thai grebo forest that just get gazetted uh, at the beginning of this war big turn to the work of uh, national partner and landscape partners. And we have the all dead uh, uh, landscape uh, uh, protected area of uh, Liberia Sabo National Park. We are working to make sure that how do we uh, make this scene as one complex um, uh, landscape where wildlife can move from Thai to uh, uh, Sapo and vice versa. But you realize that it's a complex thing. There's a logging company in between. There's a community forest and so on. So these are the landscape that we have been engaged. And the first thing that we did was to get the actors together to start talking to each other. Next slide, please. So uh, the key thing is that um, the added value of um, WABIC uh, program was that a, a little bit of shift from traditional conservation of the uh, natural resources to balancing it with the well-being of the people living around so through uh, uh, livelihood support. Um, we work nicely with this approach and work with the, our regional and national partner to identify key forest area. And all these things amounted to 1.5, uh, 1.4 million hectares of the forest being conserved. And we develop um, a strong and active um, uh, three bilateral collaboration working, two of them where uh, MIU has been signed between Liberia and Guinea. Liberia and Sierra Leone, and that of um, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire is yet to be signed, but due to uh, COVID, we delay it, and election came again and delayed it, and we hope that that will be the uh, priority for the next year program for the two countries. Um, we work with uh, various community around the those protected area, and we discuss with them what they want to see as their um, support in terms of protecting this uh, forest. And we identify a series of um, um, activities, about 10,000 people benefited, mostly around sustainable rice farming, granite, cocoa farming, cassava farming. Um, one of the key interesting things is beekeeping that we introduced and um, about 500, uh, when we were closing before COVID, 521 beekeeper were already benefiting. And the, these were from 64 communities. And they form uh, a small association cluster of 19 uh, cluster operating. We link them with a national um, uh, uh, private sector uh, buying honey, and they are working together. So they have at least 1,200 beehive across the various landscape that you see. Uh, but the beekeeping take about three years to start producing. And we just got some uh, news from in September from Grebo Crown, where uh, some of the cluster managed to get, get eight gallons of, um, of honey and sell it at 128 uh, US dollar equivalent. So people are, uh, we, we are saying it's working. The, 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 Liberia pure honey is connected to this community and now follow up without uh, Wabi project, beyond Wabi project to, to make sure that uh, uh, they see the benefit of their action. So it whole, uh, we engage more than 65,000 uh, people in the landscape. And as a result, we can see that this 1.4 million hectare is being conserved and it is really helping to sequestrate uh, carbon and helping the country to really account for their contribution in the region and uh, internationally, knowing that um, uh, um, they are driving towards a sustainable landscape, promoting uh, green development and so on. So we, we, we assess the potential of this landscape 
at the beginning of the, the, the project at the end, and we can have a link for people to see what each of these landscapes have can contribute as uh, um, in terms of carbon sequestration. Next, next slide, please. Um, I just take the law enforcement to show the type of partnership we are trying to promote in the landscape. Um, if you see, we have the administrator of the landscape, prefect, superintendent, uh, getting together across the boundary to support conservation. And uh, we have the judiciary doing, uh, working together. We have forester and we have the chief representing the community do giving their blessing and providing key information. And uh, the Mano River Union is uh, having a, a component of a security unit. We try to uh, get them interested in testing the security in the Gola Forest and making sure that those who can carry arm for wildlife should not be a threat to security. And they are working with us. So there's a regional patrol going around and we are seizing, and when we started, the, 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 the shift in crime in the forest is reducing as we are collecting gone and destroying now and um, burning uh, illegal bush meat. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, this effort is geared towards a national um, reporting uh, level, but also the our regional partners. You can see the Mano River Union has um, um, a strategic framework for natural resource management, and ECOWAS has forest conversion plan, um, and all these have seven items, and the red one are those we really contribute to in terms of uh, WABIC uh, work. And you can see that um, in terms of a law, there's a lot of initiative that we have done. Um, in terms of uh, livelihood, I cited uh, more than 10,000 people benefiting on this. In terms of knowledge of what we have, um, in terms of biodiversity, you can see some of the video link that we have in terms of uh, the result of camera traps, biodiversity conservation. So we can, with this data, we are contributing to the, these key pillars of our regional partners. Uh, next, please. To this, I will really emphasize what our other presenters have done. Thank you to our regional partner, uh, the national partner, and the landscape partner, and we stand by for further discussion and advice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuhu, and thank you to all the presenters. And on behalf of the 85 participants that we have, I give you a round of applause. Now to Q&A, to questions and answers. Participants, um, you can raise your hand. There's a, when you click the participants button, there's a raise hand uh, little button there. You can raise your hand to ask a question. In the meantime, I'm going to the Q&A tab and I'm going to read out questions there. And panelists, please be on standby to respond to the questions. So question number one is from Paul. And he's asking, do any of the panelists have thoughts on the added value of the transboundary elements? Which parts of the program really benefit from and require this transboundary elements, given that it can be costly and time consuming? I can see Emmanuel um, giving a response. Um, but in the meantime, if any panelists want to quickly jump in, please do. Emma, maybe you can come up and with some comment. Coming, sorry. Yes. That was the question about the honey. No, that's a question. Do right. any of the panelists have thoughts on the added value of the transboundary? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, yes, and I think uh, in the case of the Taisapo Forest Complex, um, the situation is very different from other um, transboundary complex because the protected area are clearly separated um, uh, and not cross-border. I mean, the, the K-1 
Cavalier River clearly, clearly separates the Ivorian part from the Liberian part. Um, and in our case, we observe that a lot of uh, traffics of natural resources from Liberia that are sent and uh, bought in, in Côte d'Ivoire. So um, before we had the, the uh, cross-border technical committee um, concerning, for example, a uh, bushmeat market, uh, the Liberian authorities were saying that the Ivorian authorities should stop the, uh, the bushmeat market, should stop the demand, whereas the Ivorian authorities were thinking that it should be better, the Liberia that should stop the supply. So really it was a transboundary question that could only be discussed um, in, in this technical committee where finally everybody and all actors concluded that it was a joint effort. And, um, and this committee also allowed to analyze the gaps in the law that for different traffic that were existing. I think another point, so I think for law enforcement, um, the, this cross-border collaboration can really be um, important. And um, another point that in the, in the complex, the Thai Sapo complex, uh, the Thai National Park has benefited from a lot of support since many, many years, and now is really a model for, the, for management, for law enforcement. Um, and we can see that now the illegal activities decreased uh, to less than uh, one signs of illegal activities per kilometer, which is what we cannot find yet in other protected areas. And so this exchange between the different uh, partners in area can really run first all the management aspects, guide the management aspects what, the, what was the international park and that was Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I see Lawrence Ayanika um, has a hand raised. Lawrence, Lawrence, if you can hear me, can you please ask your question? I see your hand raised. Yeah. Uh, can you get me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I want to start first by congratulating Dr. Nohundam. It's been uh, interesting. I earlier watched a video of what uh, is going on in West Africa. And I just want to ask this question to him. How receptive are government authorities to the conservation efforts that he is putting in place with the team in West Africa compared to what obtains in the Congo Basin where he had years of experience? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuhu. Question to you, how receptive are government officials to the work that we have been doing so far? Uh, uh, thank you, Lawrence. And I think uh, uh, the national partners here, government are more receptive from my um, experience, um, better than the um, Congo Basin. And another reason I think is that there is solid um, structure here. We are talking of very functional ECOWAS uh, and also the sub uh, group uh, of ECOWAS is Mano River Union. And uh, the authority recognizes uh, uh, um, structure. For example, the bilateral agreement between Cote d'Ivoire and La Guinea or between Liberia and um, uh, between Liberia and, uh, and Sierra Leone, they are, they are um, under the supervision of the Secretary General of the Manu River Union. So they, are, they, they have identified their priority area and we just come to support their mandate to do this. And it's much more receptive. We think that in the future, there should be some sort of um, uh, learning, learning exchange between ECOWAS and uh, the Central African um, uh, Group too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Lawrence. Thank you, Nuhu, for the response. I see a hand raised by, forgive me if I mispronounce your name, uh, Koikai Tupu. Are you there, Tupu? 
Tout pour la question t'adresse, on te pose, si tu veux poser des questions, ta, ta contribution est venue très tard et on, durant les questions et réponses, on pourra euh, euh, faire mention des de, 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 de bonnes activités que tu as de mener au niveau de la Guinée. Tupu? Okay, I know that okay so whilst we wait for Tupu, let me go to the Q&A tab and take another question. I would like you panelists to pay attention. So from Kamweti Mutu, he says, I appreciate all the presentations that are very well done. How do project partners ensure that initiatives or interventions like new crop varieties do not offset conservation agriculture that cocoa farming affords? That is, a new crop is highly successful in yields and revenues. Anyone there to answer? Uh, maybe I can start and uh, maybe Laura um, can also come in. In, in Guinea, in, in Gola, uh, which is uh, between Liberia and Sierra Leone, we uh, introduce within it is it's not like it introduced there is there is already improved variety at national level we are not going out of the country and then the farmers around the community around the protected area are not really familiar with those improved varieties so they, we bring um, what the government has already introduced and the ministry of agriculture is already promoting and we mostly contributed um, to the improved techniques of how to farm. And we managed in Angola to raise production to by 27 to 32% in various places. Uh, uh, and I think the, the new, new variety of cocoa, for example, if you take the, the cocoa variety in, in Cote d'Ivoire, it is uh, light, um, um, uh, he like uh, light, whereas um, in Gola we wanted to introduce shade tolerant species of, of 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 cocoa, and 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 that is working. And farmers can see that the market is interested in in such type of thing, and also the technique of drying, slow drying by the sun out above the ground, so that you don't have any any um, uh, bed or uh, stone in it. And it's, it's something that we are trying to promote. So we are not taking something out of blue. It's something that the government ministry of agriculture is already working on. Thank you very much. Laura, are you there to add to what Nuhu has just said? Yeah, yeah. Um, to add to it, um, we also only use native species for things like cocoa. Um, so we weren't bringing anything in that could be invasive or, or new in that way that would affect other crops. And we encouraged mix and intercropping in the training in the farm field schools as well. Thank you. Nuhu, there's a yes. question from Tupu here in French. Can you read it out and then get us responses? Thank you. Yes, um, he said, uh, He was asking the question about um, what we can do to attract uh, bee to the hive. And, and I think somebody, they gave already some um, uh, answer and it's more about anything sweet with good order. And uh, I will leave um, grantee, there's a was there's a lot of byproduct of um, uh, honey that they use to put in the hive to attract uh, to attract um, uh, bees, and also you need a very diverse environment, very good with the with the various tree to make sure that the, the, the honey will be um, the, the the best quality, and and that's why with this diversity, uh, uh, Liberia honey was um, rewarded the best honey of Africa in 2018. And you can see it's because of the forest, because of diversity of the various species that we have. So um, if any panelists want to add more from the various group uh, work with the, the beekeepers, uh, they are welcome. 
Okay, any panelists wants to add? Otherwise, I have Fomba with a hand raised. Fomba, if you can hear me, you can ask your question. Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Fomba from Gola Forest, Sierra Leone. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Rora and Dr. Nua uh, just to buttress on what they said about the the the, the uh, cocoa production, which is which has been introduced, not actually introduced newly, but it was identified uh, in in PRA assessment by our farmers that. Indeed, if the Gola Rainforest National Park want to improve their livelihood, one of the key areas they can focus was identified as cocoa production, which was not new thing. But actually the new variety has assisted our farmers and that because they are getting uh, income year in year out as supported also by Wabik through uh, agronomic practices Cocoa friendly uh, rehabilitation trainings were introduced to the farmers, which they saw as a means of building their capacity, assisting them to have access to market. So the work has so much so been uh, um, helpful and has introduced a very good way of earning income in addition to what they do in rice production. So I want to say thanks very much for organizing this kind of uh, forum so that we can share ideas. And I want to especially thank Dr. Uru and Aurora for having given support. So I thank you all. Yes. Thank you very much, Pomba. Thank you very much. Once you have spoken, can you uh, put your hand down, click the raise hand button so that it goes. Um, Lawrence, I see that your raise hand button is still, your raise hand, Okay, you still have your hand raised. Okay, thank you. So now I have Joel. Joel, your hand is raised. You can ask your question. In the meantime, panelists, can you please go to the Q&A tab and answer questions that are there? Please respond to the questions in the Q&A tab. Panelists, Joel, please ask your question. Okay, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, I think uh, I got in the middle of the presentation and uh, I got highly impressed by the presentation made by the, our brother for FFI, uh, Kewule. And he talked about uh, some opportunities as it relates to transboundary uh, initiatives. You know, if we go way back, like he said, we have had a lot of uh, initiative with Guinea, with Cote d'Ivoire, and currently, or uh, 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 recently with Gula Forest. So at this point, we are looking at what could be the synergy uh, between international institutions, let's say uh, developmental institutions, working in, in frank collaboration with uh, government institutions. Like we have uh, the case of FDA, uh, because all the support, the transboundary support, when it comes to protected areas, when they come to Peace Park, those are efforts that uh, national and uh, local institutions are paying to, to tap onto government efforts. Because at the end, the credit goes to government and the role of everyone is uh, spelled out. We have FDA. And now, for some time now, the issue of transboundary, it have little bit gone down. Beside the new project people talking about, they take the case of uh, Greater Gola. We took the we take the case of uh, uh, Thai Grebo, uh, Thai Grebo Sapo National Park. So, how how can we create a better synergy where the right. role of government can be clearly spelled out so that uh, the implementation can be for with uh, both government institutions and international institutions. Thank that you. My concern. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. Uh, Shadrach, 
are you there to respond to Joel's question? How do we create better synergies between government institutions, international institutions, and of course the local institutions, where at the end of the day, government takes credit. How do we create better working relationships and synergies? Shadrach. Thank you, Amelia. Um, thank you, Joel, for your question. Um, I think one of the most important thing for this uh, synergy is continuity. Um, I know sometimes the limitations haven't been involved with these transboundary arrangements for the last six years. Sometimes the problem is change of administration can sometimes lead to some of these synergies being um, not overlooked, but can become less of a priority. So one thing that will work really well in my mind can be for the government aid entities mm -hmm. to have a um, bilateral um, secretariat where they are able to work with, through, with and through that secretariat to keep a track of the various transboundary arrangements that um, the government has working. And so when there's a new administration, it doesn't change the priority that um, that body is just focused on transboundary initiative. So the momentum from that body, because no, that the... continues to go ahead. Um, but one thing I just wanted to point out, Joel, um, I think most of these um, initiatives had the full backing of the government, both at the local level, county level, um, district level in Africa, for example, and also at the national level. I think we just need to find a way um, to institutionalize these collaborations so that the lifespan is not dependent on one person who is driving the process power. So other people could give some other ideas. Thank you. Um, uh, Joel, yeah. I, yes. Hello, hello. Yes, Joel, go on. Yes, um, I think uh, Shadrach had tried to hit the nail on the head in the sense that our problem exactly because uh, we need to recognize the change of uh, administration which can consequence on the progress has started for the issue. Uh, but uh, what I want for us to realize that uh, at the end, new stages are being built uh, like in the case of uh, MPA, this is just a new thing that uh, has just been approved by the board, the establishment of a uh, project unit, project development monitoring unit, uh, which um, have been uh, appointed as the head, as the head of this uh, uh, unit. So meaning that uh, my role is to, to revamp the partnership that I existed between uh, MPA and uh, partners and at the same time working with these partners when they come to designing new initiatives so that FDA cannot be a spectator or not only play a role of uh, uh, signing the endorsement letter but rather FDA should be available when it comes to crafting of this new idea like currently with Wabic 2 where initiatives are honor development FDA role should be defined from the onset so that we can take part in the reflection. It can be that it has been crafted to bring and then our role, we are not aware of it. So we should be part of the crafting from the onset so that we can all drive the process together. So uh, Cedric, that meaning that from this meeting, we are, I think we need to take it to another level. The partnership, how can we make it, uh, um, how can we make it uh, viable? How can we make it productive? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I think it was just to inject few few ideas into what Sidrak has said because he has said all. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Point well made. And I'm sure that there are people on this call who are taking note of the important points you are making that government actors should be at the table from day zero in designing the uh, particular program or project intervention. Thank you. Uh, I see a few more hands here, and I see about 14 questions in the Q&A tab. Panelists, 
please direct your attention to the Q&A tab and answer the questions. I have four hands here, I'm calling them and I will return to the Q&A tab by which time the panelists would have answered quite a few. Tupo, I see your hand is still up here. I don't know if you still have a question or you just haven't uh, brought it down since you raised it. Tupo, are you there? Can you hear me? Is French interpretation going on for him? Um, Tupo, um, three seconds and I'll go on to call the next hand raised. One. Two, three. Okay, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Nuesiri, your hand is up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ndam, uh, for your presentation. During your presentation, I heard you talk about community forest. So my question is with regards to community forest, um, what are the lessons that come out from your work um, over there, respect to community forest, that you think can be essential and uh, helpful to those of us that have worked on community forest in uh, Central Africa, including yourself and uh, some of the work that you have done in the past. Mm -hmm. So what are the lessons from your current work that you think are useful and helpful respect to community forest? Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Fantastic question. Any answers? Nuhu, Emmanuel, Laura, Shadrach. Uh, maybe I will start. Um, many of the grantee will will add. I just want to say, uh, Dr. Emma is 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 um, more comp complex here. Um, Liberia has a very clear roadmap for community forests and they have established many community forests. But unfortunately, some of the um, promoters or some of the beneficiary gear that was purely logging and uh, they have been moratorium to stop and analyze uh, that. But in other countries like Sierra Leone and so on, they have uh, some um, short step and, and we feel that community forest is very, very useful in conservation because some of the scientists or threatened species like Pimi Ipo uh, do not just um, um, occur in the protected area, but also in community forest. So if you really want to protect those species, you need to work with the community uh, of, uh, around those uh, area and uh, experience of uh, Gola, um, um, is there to say that unless you work with the community and make sure that uh, some of the key forests are protected and provide corridor to various block of um, uh, protected uh, 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 national park, it would not work. So it is a very valuable here. And, and I think we have the same experience in, in, in Central Africa where we promoted this and I remember uh, the study of the World Bank on 400 community forests and, and realized that there is somewhere working, but others have a lot of challenges. And uh, those are the challenges that we are trying to address here. But everybody value their, their contribution if it is well managed, especially when they are around the protected area to serve as um, uh, buffer, also to serve as corridor. So anybody from the panel, please. Panel, panelists. Hello, panelists. Emma, you want to talk about uh, anyway? Kabali, no, Kabali is community forest or, or in, in Cote d'Ivoire, community forest in, or classified forest is a little bit different from community forest. So community forest in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, it's like, uh, it, it, are very, very small. I mean, that's not at all comparable and that's not the same subject as the community forest in Liberia. Um, so the, like, the classified forest is another type of uh, forest, but that is, that's the government that's still um, working or you know, uh, supporting the, the preservation or the sustainable logging of these forests. So in Côte d'Ivoire, it's only very, very small community forest. Like, um, that are very useful for the communities to be able to keep um, 
some uh, some trees for uh, medicine for food but um because um agriculture is so um is de has developed so much that there is not trees anymore in the um, in the plantation so i mean it's now that the communities are realizing that um, they're working further and further to get some wood or to build, uh, to find some wood to build their houses. So the community forests are um, very important in Côte d'Ivoire, but they remain very, very small. And um, yeah, I didn't want to intervene because the subject of community forest in Liberia is something very, very different. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So we have 10 minutes to finish this webinar. I have two hands up here. And as I keep referring to the Q&A tab panelists, please go there and answer the questions. Fatma Takata, please. Fatma. Yes, please. Go on. Please, you have this room or space. <laughs> All right. I want to thank all the presenters and uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity for me to be part of this meeting. And um, as former communications of Wabi projects in Freetown, I think I have an idea of the reason for the project between Gola Sierra Leone and Gola Liberia. One of them is to see how the two forests could uh, link to each other and be protected as a whole forest because the situation was Sierra Leone was protected. Sierra Leone Gola was really under high protection by RFPB, but um, uh, Gola Liberia was not that protected. It was recently that they had an agreement on protecting it. So with the Wabi Core USAID project, I just want to know how far they have gone in making sure that the two forests connect and are protected. And if not, what are the challenges and what's the way forward to make sure the two forests become a whole and connected to the remaining forests of the uh, Upper Guinea uh, forest landscape? Thank you very much, Fatmata. Um, who is responding to Fatmata's question? the extent to which two particular forests have been connected? If not, what have been the challenges? Hi, uh, that'd be my question, I think. Um, so the, um, the Sierra Leone forest um, wasn't under protection by RSPB as such. It was, it's a protected area, national protected area. So it's Sierra Leone government. Um, and Liberia, on the Liberian side, that's a national park now as well, uh, more recently. So both areas are uh, national park status. Um, the two have been linked um, through um, an MOU. So it's a, a transboundary peace park. And under this WABIC project, we um, kind of restarted the governments working together and meeting together to talk about the landscape as a whole. And they've strengthened and re-signed an MOU to the agrees that they'll work together to protect um, the Gola forest as one. Um, and in the future, we're looking at doing more transboundary work. So having joint um, ranger patrols, um, joint survey methods and that kind of thing. So everything's sort of consistent across the two um, parts of the landscape. Thank you, Laura. I'll take the last Hey, another person. Adele, Adewale, Adele, Adele, you have shown up. Okay. So, Dr. Abdul Aziz, are you there? You have an opportunity to ask your question. Okay. Uh, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the presenter for all the presentation they already did. And uh, I will thank Swabik for the initiative. And what I want to ask to the panelists and uh, to the presenter, uh, what kind of method uh, they, they share with the rural, uh, they share for this experience uh, to the stakeholders in rural area? I want to know what uh, kind of experience they 
this method the shout to the community in the rural area. Thank you for for this thing. Hello. Hello. Panelist, who is answering Dr. Abdulaziz's question? What kind of techniques have you been sharing with the local people? Nuhu, Laura. In terms of Imanuel. what? Oh. So, so um, one, one thing I could just uh, quickly check, I don't know if you answer your question, but one of the things we have done um, at the local level, in addition to awareness raising, has been to work um, in supporting the formation of community level governance institutions. So around Strapo National Park, um, we have created nine governance clusters um, along traditional line. And the intention of this governance cluster is to give communities or platform through which they can get a um, representation um, with a goal of promoting collaborative management of the national park. So um, historically, SAPO has been more of a militaristic approach to management. Um, but now we trying to support community involvement in management of the buffer area, also giving the community a platform to which they can bring complaints um, against rangers in a very orderly manner. Because our research over the past years has shown that that is one of the point of, um, of, of uh, distrust because the communities did not think they had a platform to get redress or a way to which they could systematically uh, take their grievances to the park. Because it's a national park, there's, limit, there's no activity um, utilization activity that can human utilization activity and go on. But we're working with the communities and the FDA to encourage collaborative management of the buffer era through these governance institutions. So in addition to livelihood, in addition to awareness raising, these governance platforms have been really, really useful. Um, where, for example, one quick story before we end. Um, in the past, SAPO have had a lot of problem with um, illegal mining. And after we formed this platform, we've had incidents, uh, one in particular where a member of the governance institution walked for three hours to call the park authorities to um, tell them to come and check if the, someone who came with a mining license was operating or the license would fall in the park. Um, so that, that, you know, that has been very helpful in facilitating some form of um, um, interaction between the community. So governance has been um, something very useful. I hope that answers part of your question. Thank you. Thank you, Shadrach. Adewale Adeleke. Uh, thank you, Madam Facilitator. Uh, I want to just uh, uh, follow up on the questions asked by uh, Batimata and the answers uh, offered by Laura. I think in addition to the answer offered by Laura, uh, Wapi thought that it is not very useful to allow the two bowlers to remain islands and uh, thought the best approach would be to introduce the forest landscape restoration concept into the Gola, greater Gola landscape and uh, all the other landscapes that we have worked on. Uh, just uh, about one month ago, Wabik uh, carried out, uh, used the room, the uh, restoration opportunity assessment methodology to look at Greater Gola, where there will be the opportunity of linking uh, all the protected areas, including community forests, with each other. So for, for the purpose of uh, achieving uh, biodiversity conservation, ensuring the corridors for movement of uh, wildlife and biodiversity, and ensuring that communities are able to benefit from uh, the resources. This, this concept 
ensure that uh, uh, farmers could carry out to agroforestry uh, as well as uh, practice conservation, other conservation efforts that support ecosystem management. I just thought I should mention that in addition to the answers offered uh, by uh, Laura. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adewele Adeleke of Nigeria. Now, um, so in the next two minutes, we bring this webinar to a close. In the Q&A tab, there are a few questions. So for example, Kamwati wants to know some of the measurement indicators that were used to gauge level of success with transboundary or bilateral law enforcement around level of governance and accountability and anti-corruption goals. Anybody there want to give? Numu, I see that you are going to answer this question live. Are you ready to go, Numu? Yeah, I was, I was trying to answer the two question where how we got to 1.4 million hectares. And I'm telling him that we simply sum uh, the various protected area and uh, the landscape that where we are working. And uh, Ziyama where you work is already 111,000 hectares. So it's contributing to that. Um, so, so, so that's how we get to the indicator on that. On the other question about the transboundary, um, I think uh, um, the law enforcement is one example where um, uh, the various countries are working on this. And especially we have issue at the transboundary area. No, no, if I may, in, uh, in, he's asking about measurement indicators that were used to gauge success. Oh, to gauge success, yes. Uh, you, you, the, um, the signing of the agreement, the fact that the elephant are moving from, in September, for example, elephant moved from Guinea to Liberia and from Liberia to Cote d'Ivoire. And you can see community forester from the two countries uh, calling each other and making sure that they can direct the elephant back to the forest instead of shooting it down. down. So for me, it's the real, application of this uh, impact of this agreement that it, the success is there. If there was no agreement, the owner would have been coming with the, with, with, with the gun and putting this down. So for me, uh, the free movement of wildlife, the transboundary law enforcement, for example, is being developed and, and, and the two uh, actors are talking together. That is a sign where uh, there's a recent, there is a, a recent, um, uh, law made by uh, regulation made by uh, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire to say anybody mining, for example, on on on, on the Cavalli River, before when when you get there, they will run to the other side and say, oh, we are now on the Cote d'Ivoire side. If it is the law enforcement officer from Liberia, if it is from Cote d'Ivoire, they will shift the other side. But the two country had met together and agree on the policy to address this challenging issue. And that's in making very hard for uh, illegal manner to operate freely. Okay. Um, no, there are three last questions here in the Q&A button that I'd like us to take quickly. Um, one from Tupu in French. Then there's Michael Balinga saying, can we expand a bit on the lessons learned from the experience of the species working group in ensuring coordination among stakeholders for wildlife enforcement. And there's the last one from Jean Vier. I would like to thank all presenters. My question is the following. Do you think we can develop projects and get success across transboundary PAs when the different managers adopt different approaches, such as African Parks Network in Benin for the components of work complex and national institutions in Burkina Faso and Niger. Nuhu, can you respond quickly to all these three questions and then I give my closing remarks. Thank you. Yes, and I think uh, my, the, the, the special working group is, is a concept of creating a national panel where all the experts can get together to exchange their information on, on, on biodiversity. 
and and if this one is really working in Liberia, we try to take the model to the other country uh, across West Africa and introduce the concept, as you know. But um, uh, all depend on the dynamism of the local actor. And I really, uh, this is an opportunity for me to thank the actor in Liberia. And maybe the question is to them: How do we get this thing working in Cote d'Ivoire? I know Emma is so busy; he wanted to, she wanted to assist, but it didn't work. So I leave that to, to that level. They are all on the ground. They can come and learn from Liberia. It's really working. And the government of Liberia is seeing this as a technical advisor to their work, FGA. In, in terms of um, the other question on, on, on uh, educator of the, um, the uh, Tupu question, I think I tried to answer that already, that we are summing the okay. size of protected area. The last question of Mr. Mr. Janvier Aglisi uh, is, is, is that we, we feel that the first key thing is to identify pro forest to be protected, develop action on that. And, and I agree with him that once we have the protected area um, secure in terms of status, they need to be talking to each other. Wabi has a trained uh, scientist, 22 scientist officer in West Africa. And these are like the advisor to conservation in terms of fighting against uh, illegal activities. And, and I feel that networking is very key. And, and, and but the, the first step is make sure that all the key forest sites have legal protection status, like whether it's a national reserve or whatever. And, and I think that I agree with you, but we need to move that direction, but it takes time. Thank you all very much. Thank you presenters and thank you participants for staying with us. As I said, this is the second of three close out webinars that WABE is organizing. The last one uh, will come off on 10th December. So be on the lookout for the invitation. Please also note that a, a book of links will be shared to all of you who have participated that have all the presentations and the key resources for this webinar on the link. A, a, a participant called Glenn has made a comment and that sort of summarizes my own uh, what I, what I think will be a good summary to this webinar. He says, thanks everyone. Very interesting information and very important to share amongst those passionate about saving the upper Guinean forest. I'll just expand it to say that it is for all of us who are interested in saving forests in West Africa, in Africa and around the globe. The Wabic project here has shown us that it is possible. Now, some of the interesting, very fundamental things that were been touched on that often are glossed over are the issues of women and youth engagement, the issue of livelihoods, and the balance, balancing conservation and livelihood and well being of forest edge communities. That is so critical to success. And of course, the training and capacity strengthening and how they work across boundaries. And importantly working on what is important for the different uh, institutions uh, mru um, ECOWAS, and the, the the different partners that they work with this particular component learning component is one that i found very complex that wabic was able to work through many partners across many countries and through the grantees and amazing work has been done Managing different people, managing different organizations across different countries definitely is complex, and but great success has been achieved. Some of you have hinted on the issues of greater collaboration, greater synergies, and I think that uh, the foundation has been made uh, by this particular project, and going forward, a lot more can be done. One last thing that I'd like to comment on that has come out from this conversation is the fact that through the interventions, businesses have been best, businesses are growing, and a greater and stronger social cohesion 
has been built and continue to be built across the different countries just by focusing on fundamental and important but often glossed over uh, actors and activities. So thank you all for joining us for this webinar. The next one, as I say, is coming on on 10th December on increasing coastal resilience to climate change. Any questions, requests for documents, et cetera, can be addressed to stephen.keleha. Stephen is S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Keleha, K-E-L-L-E-H-E-R at Wabek org and i'm sure the technical team will put this email address out immediately so that you can all contact Stephen for any further questions take note again that the documents will be sent to you through the book of links so that you have access to all this beautiful work outcome outputs that have been generated i thank you all participants 66 of you are still hanging on here i thank you very much i appreciate this and I respect you. Thank you. Bye till the next webinar. Bye-bye.